Well, thank you very much, Dyer. And even though I have a voice that can be heard on a sailboat deck, I think I'll use this just to make sure. I'm very uh, honored to have so many of you attend in this uh, fine summer evening. And I want to take you on a little voyage, both in uh, different boats and in time going back. This talk is billed as um, the celebration of three very important one design classes that were designed by my grandfather, Captain Nathaniel Green Harrisoff. And these are the same classes that we celebrated very much the 1st of May when we had our um, biennial um, Classic Yacht Symposium. And I'm going to repeat some of that, but not all of that. But I want to extend the talk to uh, some issues that sort of surround the celebration of those great classes, which are listed here, the Newport 29. Of course, you know, in the old days when uh, things were kind of straightforward and honest, 29 meant 29 feet on the waterline, not overall. And the 12 and a half footer, same thing, 12 and a half on the waterline, 16 overall. And the Buzzers Bay 25s, which uh, we have one right here, uh, a very wonderful Buzzer Bay 25 uh, area donated by Paul Bates. It's been restored, but he still has to add a few things like the traveler. So if you see Paul, remind him of that because these uh, restorations are never quite complete. But what I want to do is uh, initially uh, tell some things about how this all happened. What is the basis of the traditions that this museum is so effectively conveying to those who come to visit here. Uh, where did the Harrisos come from? Uh, what were their methods? Why did they succeed? What were their failures? I want to go into some of that. And then uh, I want to talk about the three classes. And then at the end, I want to cover a little bit of our modern sailing, including the sailing school of the Harrisos Marine Museum, which is prospering better this year than ever with better management and um, also, I think, better care of our vulnerable boats, which is all to the good. So to begin with, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, looking back, we do have a very interesting family. And one of the pleasures of getting ready for this presentation was to look back at this booklet. This is a booklet of what's called the Harrison Marine Museum Chronicle. And regrettably, this started after the um, passing of my great father, Sid Harrisoff. But the authors of it are some wonderful uncles. A. Griswold Harrisoff, who was chief engineer of development at uh, Chrysler Automobile Company, and Clarence Harrisoff, the youngest of my um, father's four brothers, who worked uh, his career at the Navy Department. And they both have a kind of a keen sense of irony and. Um, humor and they brought forth some very interesting stories, which some of which I'd like to recount to you. But the basic thing I'd like to say before the lights go down and we look at illustrations to punctuate some stories, um, Captain Nat Harrisoff was born in 1848 and lived 90 years to 1938. Perhaps thankfully he passed on just before the devastating hurricane of 1938 that destroyed his waterfront boathouse along with 13 magnificent small craft, which were it not for that, those would be here on loan or given to this museum. But we do have quite a few other boats, um, 50 or 60, which do the job here. He um, apparently had an early bent for mathematics and science, and he attended the Massachusetts Institute of Technology when MIT was brand new. He even studied under William Barton Rogers, the founder of MIT. And for some reason of which I'm not aware, he was approached by the uh, Commodore and board of the Boston Yacht Club, which wanted uh, a rating rule. They wanted a formula by which to handicap yachts that would race. And of course, this was at a time before there was a lot of yacht racing. So Captain Nett came up with a formula. And then he was asked to develop time around tables. Well, that involves a whole lot of uh, calculations, and he had to use logarithms because he wanted the tables to express correctly the allowance and time for a small boat racing against a big boat. 
So we did it with logarithms, and I don't know how long it took him, but it must have been quite a few evenings. And 100 years later, when I was studying at MIT, I decided to do the same job over again, uh, and which won't surprise uh, some of you who are in computers all the time. It took me about one second with an IBM uh, system computer. And the answers were exactly the same, which is the main point of this. So those tables were used for more than 100 years. They're still being used somewhat. Captain Nat's interest, which many of you may be surprised about, and this is according to my own father, who worked with him uh, so long, Captain Nat's interest was much more in mechanics and in engines, and particularly in steam engines. So after studies in Cambridge in Boston, he went to work for the Corliss Engine Company of Rhode Island, which were the leading builders of steam machinery in America, particularly of very large machines. And it's a curious thing that after he'd been there for a few years, he was sent down to Philadelphia to assist one of the Corliss uh, foremen to, to set up a huge steam machine for the um, convocation celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. So that was in 1876. Well, the foreman took sick. So Nat Harrisoff, age uh, 28, set up this mammoth machine. The flywheel was about 32 feet in diameter, and it drove uh, a belt, which then ran a shaft the length of this building, and all the machines of the uh, convocation had belts that went off pulleys on this shaft. So while the President of the United States and the President of Brazil were out in the, um, with the crowd, turning some huge valve for the shaft through the wall, and by the way, the shaft went through the wall, but it wasn't connected to anything, it was Captain Nat way down below that actually turned on the steam just without the machine going. So he continued to have a great interest in the development of steam machinery. But meanwhile, his older brother, Mr. J.B. Harrisoff, who was seven, who was seven years older, uh, had started building boats right here. The family lived in the house that's just across the field here. And the reason they started the boat building business was these young boys just walked across the street and started building boats. There was no DEM, CRMC, or <laughs> other people who plague us today, they just worked across the street and started building boats. Now, Mr. J.B. was a very ambitious fellow. Uh, he um, was essential to the company and he became the president, of course. But unfortunately, he had poor eyesight and uh, at the age of 17, he became blind. Uh, he lost one eye earlier and he lost the second eye through a, a boyhood accident, which was a tragedy. And he was very depressed for a while, but he pulled out of it and he ran this great company for about 55 years. He did all the um, estimating, he hired and fired the personnel. He was uh, the person who mostly dealt with the clients, who many of them were businessmen from New York, J.P. Morgan, uh, Carnegie, all the people that wanted great yachts. The company uh, was very basic. They did no advertising. However, I'll tell you in a minute, one way they did get uh, notoriety was brought the business here. And their idea was that they would never borrow any money. They would build the company up from the uh, profits. And they'd always try to do the best possible product and charge what it required. They gradually accumulated a magnificent group of workmen some of whom worked here as much as 40 years, and some of them worked right alongside their own sons. And that is a factor which some of us who think about the whole history feel is greatly neglected. That sure, the Harrisoffs were smart, and sure they ran a good business, and sure Captain Nat designed good boats, but it was these magnificent workers, descendants of whom many live in Bristol still, that made it all work. And I'm going to tell you a couple of uh, vignettes about some of those guys because they were not only great workers, but they also had something of a sense of humor. The um, first significant vessels they built were steam-powered vessels. They, they built um, 
a boat called the Seven Brothers for the Seven Church Brothers of Common Fence Point in uh, uh, Tiverton. And that was a curious thing because uh, there were seven Harrisoft brothers in my grandfather's family. So it was seven brothers building for seven brothers. And um, they also built early naval um, torpedo boats. These were small craft, 56 feet long, only about eight and a half feet wide. They had a single cylinder steam engine. Nobody had yet invented uh, self-propelled torpedoes. So the torpedo was a blob of dynamite on the end of a pole, like a spinnaker pole. And the idea was they'd sneak up on a big ship, put this dynamite at the water line, blow a hole through the ship so it would sink. And if they were lucky, I guess they could back off and get away. But it must have been very hazardous duty. As a consequence of that and other notoriety, the uh, U.S. Navy procured the first ocean-going torpedo boats from the Harris House. One of them, named the uh, uh, U.S. Cushing, was uh, dubbed the uh, Seagoing Torpedo Boat Number no. One, and it was a very, very interesting design. Of course, built of steel, had um, tremendously interesting machines. It was quadruple expansion, meaning that. The high pressure then had a second pressure, a third pressure, and a fourth pressure. And that meant so much expansion of the steam going through, they had to use two cylinders for the low pressure steam. So this was an engine with uh, not three cylinders, not four cylinders, but five cylinders. And the uh, Cushing was very fast, probably one of the fastest steam vessels in the world at that time. And uh, then in 1891, Captain Nat was asked to design a sailboat for what was to be a new um, outstanding class of the New York Yacht Club. They called it the 46-foot class. And they got all the designers of America to design and build boats for it. And they were about 46 feet in the waterline and about 70 plus feet overall. Curiously enough, they're about the same size as a modern 12 meter boat. So there were eight boats and eight races. And Captain Nat designed the boat, was built here, and had a lot of new features, cutaway profile, less wetted surface, one of the earliest boats to have all outside lead ballast, uh, new lighter methods of construction, taller rig, better sails, and Captain Nat at the helm. Well, this great class was intended to go for years, but what went wrong was that the Gloriana that he designed uh, won every race. And that did two things. It destroyed the class, because they're all the rest of them demoralized, <laughs> and it elevated him to the prominence to get the job of designing America's Cup defenders, which he then did. He designed boats that won the America's Cup six times, and um, one of them, the Reliance, was the largest America's Cup boat ever. And I think some of you are aware of the magnificent project that uh, Sandy's doing here to build a scale model of the Reliance. The Reliance was 144 feet long on deck, which just to give you a sense of that, is exactly twice the length of uh, Bill Koch's America's Cup boat that he's donated to the museum that's out here. So when you go out after the talk, look at that and think of the Reliance twice as long. So the model is going to be 24 feet long, but from the end of the bowsprit to the end of the boom, it's going to be 33 feet. And the rig is going to extend with a main topsail 33 feet above the level of the waterline. The model is going to be magnificent. There's every little fitting. Even the cleats look as though they're hollow like the original Aerosol cleats. It's supposed to be finished a year from now. And you'll be seeing it, hopefully, out in front here to uh, herald the fact this museum exists. Well, now with that uh, brief introduction of the things they did, I want to, as I look with you at some of these illustrations, I want to remark about uh, a little more detail on some of the methods and also um, read to you a few uh, items that bear on this thing for both your uh, hopefully both of your edification and some amusement. I've always said to friends that the basic rule of public speaking is never, never read anything. 
So you are helping me with an experiment tonight when I'm going to violate my own rule. And uh, we'll see if it works or not. Well, with that, could we have the lights down and we'll proceed with some of these illustrations.